I don't remember the first time I heard the phrase Chernobyl children, but I know that it happened in the UK. I went to the UK at the age of nine. My father heard that this uh, UK-based organization was looking for kids in our town and surrounding areas um, to send them to the UK for long, summer-long recuperative stays with host families to get us away from the radiation. And my father asked a um, principal assistant at my school to come to my house, to our house to talk about it. My father wanted me and my sister to go to the UK and um, to make sure that assistant principal would put our names on the list, invited him home and on that day my parents slaughtered a pig so my mom was making fresh pork and that's what my father and the man ate and they drank vodka and um, late in the evening the man left wobbly and with a chunk of fresh pork under his armpit and so just like that I got on the list my sister couldn't because the organization was accepting only one kid per family and being the youngest my uh, father decided that I would go I was the youngest in my group and I think everybody else who was in the group was also bribed officials um, because all the kids were teachers kids, doctors kids, kids of the firefighters so it was quite a, like an elite a group of kids and um, even though we knew that it had to do with the with the radiation we didn't really talk about it, we didn't think much about it, we were just excited to go to um, abroad and have access to the things that we didn't have in Belarus. It was 90s, um, there was no economy, no goods, no jobs, it was extremely difficult. Um, we didn't even have clothes, so my parents were excited that uh, we could get some clothes and that, and that was uh, more exciting than um, knowing that I would be away from the radiation. We had a lot of cancer on our street. Um, we had a neighbor who died at the age of 16. He was battling cancer for five years and living in hospitals on and off during all those years. We had little girls die with leukemia. We had a family that lost two family, uh, family members to cancer. But um, it was quite normalized. Nobody thought um, it was something catastrophic and certainly there wasn't much discussion about the connection between cancer and radiation. Uh, I don't remember studying it in school, I don't remember discussing it in school and uh, people generally didn't like talking about it. They they were scared of cancer even though we didn't talk about it. Maybe that's why we didn't talk about it. We were scared of it. People even didn't use the word cancer. They used um, such words to describe it as um, that the the disease or the plague um, but um, some even thought that it was contagious so when I went to the UK I didn't really think much of it but the organization measured um, everybody's radiation at the airport in Belarus and then also at the airport in London um, at the end of our stay when we were on our way back to Belarus and I do remember hearing that um, we had less radiation in us. Just just by being away for a month, I think, we could reduce our radiation levels. And um, again, it wasn't something that I was excited about, really. It was routine uh, procedure for me uh, in my hometown. With my class, we, once a year we would go to the hospital holding hands with our teacher ahead of us and we would sit in this big chair with things hooked up to us and it measured our radiation. So when we did that um, in the UK before and after our trip, um, it was just, uh, just another routine things that we had to do. Um, the family, my host family, decided to visit me and my family in Belarus the year after I came back. 
and they really liked my sister and they decided to invite me and my sister back so I went back for another stay with them and then after that they did, they invited me again so I was in the UK three times and my sister two times um, and that was really the best time of my childhood um, we ate uh, anything we wanted and drank a lot of orange juice we didn't have access to fresh fresh fruits in Belarus growing up um, and in the UK we we swam we learned how to swim we went to the pool twice a week and we went to the ocean and um, it just felt like it was a big summer camp it was really fun um, and I didn't want to think that it was all happening because I had radiation um, but during those trips people would come up to me and my host family and offer gifts clothes and bags and toothpaste and toothbrushes and they would say for the Chernobyl children and that was the first time that I realized there was something colossally catastrophically wrong with me and these people are not around me because I'm cool and interesting they're around me because there's something wrong with me um, and um, it was really uncomfortable to know that I was ashamed of it um, during one of the trips they give us uh, everybody got a cap and it said Chernobyl children on it. Um, I didn't know right away that it said Chernobyl children because I didn't speak English. I really loved the cap and in Belarus I wore it everywhere. I was really proud of it. But as soon as I learned that the words meant Chernobyl children, I stopped wearing it. I really felt ashamed. Um, and uh, I think it hit me when humanitarians from Germany and the Netherlands started coming to my town and they were also bringing secondhand clothes and food in cans and um, medications and one time my mom and I were, were walking through the park through the historic park and there was a family sitting on the bench and I knew they were humanitarians they were westerners because uh, of what they were wearing jeans and t-shirts and sneakers and they looked at us as if we were aliens and I knew they were looking at us to check for signs of radiation on our bodies and I felt really embarrassed and um, I immediately straightened myself up and looked down to hide my eyes I felt extremely uncomfortable so after the first trip to the UK, I came back with chocolates. My host family gave me chocolates to give to my parents and my brother and my sister. So when I came back, my mom told me to go give some chocolates to our sick neighbor, Sasha, the one who was battling cancer for five years. And before my trip, he was quite well. He was biking with his older brother. So I thought um, he would be in the same state. But after not finding him on the street, I went to his house and asked his mother to take me to his room and um, she walked me to his room and then she left. And as soon as I saw Sasha, I knew that he was gone. He was uh, almost dead, hollow cheekbones, no eyes. He was propped up on this huge pillow behind him and his face was uh, green, purple, blue. It was so scary it was it was a skeleton and I was so scared and I just stood there at the foot of his bed and I put the chocolates in his bed and I ran away oh, I was so scared and I came I, I came home and I and I yelled at my mom why didn't you tell me and she said if I told you you, you would have not gone and she was right I was I was afraid of cancer I was afraid to be near people with cancer. I also thought it was contagious. Um, my grandpa died of cancer. His brother and wife died of cancer. Um, my grandma, his wife, now is all by herself and the neighbors around her are dying of cancer now. But at the same time, nobody talks about it. People uh, don't make the connections or if they do, they don't, they don't talk about it. Even though radiation is in the food, in the berries, in the mushrooms that people pick, um, it's in everything. Um, so when people ask uh, for my opinion on nuclear power from a scientific point of view, um, I think it makes a lot of sense to go nuclear. 
especially when we learn to manage nuclear waste. I think that will be a very good option for providing energy. But on a human level, I think it's a horrific thing to do, um, knowing how much misery the explosion brought to my country, to my family, to my friends. I just can't support it. Um, the radiation will be there in the soil for thousands of years and people of my generation, people who are 30s now, having kids with mutations. So you don't know when this radiation is gonna manifest itself, in which form and uh, how and when and with how many people. Um, so there's still a lot of people dying and, and, and because people are not talking about it, um, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It's, re it's still really, really, really fresh. Um, it's really fresh and it's there, um, even though it's silenced. It's silenced by the people themselves. They just, they just want to go on with their lives. Nobody wants to uh, think that their land that they grew up on is contaminated, is, is bad, and they need to move or do something about it. Um, we have a very strong connection and attachment to our land. We don't move often. Uh, we don't move often at all. We're usually born, raised um, um, in the same place, and we just move once um, away from the parents, um, and that's it. Um, and we have so established this very strong connection to the land. A lot of Belarusian literature, especially poetry, is about um, the land, it's about the soil, it's about that connection that people have with their surroundings. So to admit that that's polluted and poisoned and bad, it's just not something that uh, people are willing to take on. My land, my motherland, is one of the most contaminated places on earth because of this disaster and I don't want anyone to have that, to experience that. Invisible hearts buried in the tainted soil, a person afraid to touch, another one taken by tomorrow, empty mind thinking only of sorrow, cesium-137, and another child is dead, you know it. I used to play in the water and air, now I pick mushrooms and berries with more fear than ever. Cesium-137 I used to love working the fields. Now I grow my wheat with hands crooked and weak. Cesium-137 I used to dance in the rain with a headscarf off and no shoes on my feet. Now I stay inside and stare at the empty street. Cesium-137 I used to admire the birds, their ungodly image and song. Now I bury their wings, broken and burnt. Cesium-137